Uh, this is the Neo Books call on Monday, October 9th, 2023. Klaus is back from some adventures. Um, yeah. Um, any fun stories from your adventures? Well, I mean, it was it was a Rhodes Scholar trip, and I, I talked about it on on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. So there's really not not much to add to that. Yeah, my my mind is more messed up right now because my daughter happens to be in Tel Aviv at the moment with her three oh, wow. girls. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we've been trying to encourage her to get out, but they just started uh, shelling the airport. And so the airport is closed down. And so that uh, that is not going to resolve itself really fast. You know? Wow. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's a mess. It's a really big mess. Um, and every, every time I read an interesting article about it, the mess expands. Yeah, because you know, these guys are being used. I mean, the Palestinians are being used by Iran and Russia. You know? Um, because the timing is just perfect, right? You, you have this insane election in the in Congress, you know, trying to vote for somebody who wants to instantly cut off her, her assistance to the Ukraine, and you have the Saudi-Israeli uh, peace treaty that the Iranians don't like. So the the timing is uh, is, is is sort of uh, 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 directed apparently. And I don't know how they would escalate this thing, but it seems they would, you know, I mean, they have been coming up with some pretty uh, impressive surprises so far, so there could be more in store. Yeah, I think one of the first things the U.S. did dipl diplomatically is go go tell everybody in the area, hey, do not use this uh, this moment to attack Iran, I mean, to attack Israel. But I... This could easily spin into a whole lot of other things. I don't know. Otherwise, otherwise, it's a desperate and sort of suicidal attempt by Hamas to get revenge, draw attention. I compare this to a guy who uh, who feels like he needs to uh, fight this two hundred and fifty pound uh, champion boxer. And uh, gets knocked to the ground and goes back up and gets knocked down and goes back up and just refuses to give up. You know? And I mean, there comes a point where you know this this is it's so senseless and and uh, um, I mean, it's it's just such a radically unsolvable issue. You know, I mean, you just you you just um, there's just no solution because the Israelis are not really very nice people either. I mean, you see what they're doing. Yeah. Living in Gaza has been pretty awful for a pretty long time. Um, yeah. Well, let's go to our book. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, Pete, do you want to check in a bit about the pros calls? Uh, sure. Um, Chris Fusion is uh, kind of on a a request from Ray Schmitz um, uh, was the idea that we could get started with uh, collaborative writing using Markdown and Git. Um, so it it's a sibling of NeoBooks, kind of um, also a um, a close sibling of Massive Wiki. Um, we're still getting off the ground. Uh, it's been a little bit tricky trying to be. We have um, people who aren't really OGM people. Um, and it was a little hard to find a common common chat place, common chat notifications. Um, it's still a little bit challenging, but we've got a Metamost uh, channel. I'm probably going to set up a, an announce only email list. Um, it's funny once you get away from people who are in OGM, it's you know I, you get used to in OGM there you can at least say, you know, there's a Mattermost server and some people go, well, whatever. Yeah. And some people go, oh, okay, I got it. But, you know, anywhere else, you know, it's like there's not an email list that they're part of. There's not a chat server that they're part of. They're, you know, disconnected. And it's weird getting, especially a team of people connected. So that's been a bit of a challenge. 
Um, I started doing Monday meetings um, at 7 a.m. and noon uh, Pacific. I don't know how long we'll keep them. We'll see. Um, you want to describe the goals just so Klaus is up to speed? I don't know, Klaus, I don't know if you've the, been seeing what Pete's been sending. The, uh, the goal of goal of ProSfusion is to train up folks to do collaborative writing, not using Google Docs, but using Markdown and, and Git. So the, and what it, and, and Git and GitHub, I guess. Um, I actually posted a really cool kind of a scenario um, in, uh, in the channel about an experience I had during programming um, it was the perfect kind of programming thing where I started working with somebody I don't even know on a project that, you know, we both have interest in, his project, I think. Actually, this one was mine. Um, so it's really common on GitHub to, I, I did this, another one over the weekend, you know, some project that you found interesting, you've contributed a patch to, you've made a comment, and then, you know, somebody improves the thing on you and you get some notifications and you go in and you can find in a fine grained way, you know, comment or approve changes, make suggestions of other changes. Um, <clears throat> so it's a little bit like working on a Google doc, except the whole thing is super decentralized and super asynchronous and can tolerate a ton of people and very, very, very fine grained changes. And multiple overlapping sets of fine-grained changes. And all of that is easy um, in a way that you, you, you can't even really imagine from Google Docs or Word. Easy once somebody has absorbed how GitHub basically does its stance. Well, that's very funny. It's, it's, it it's, is very it's, funny. It's, it's choosing <laughs> to interpret this as a thumbs up gesture. It's a thumbs up. That's right. That's very funny. Um, so the you're right. The flip side, or the you know the, so that's the the pro. The con is um, that um, Git has always been the bailiwick of programmers, and nobody's really made much effort in making it usable for civvies. So that's the challenge for Muggles. Um, and. Has anybody done, uh, I don't know if it could be squeezed down into two minutes, but assume that somebody could be pre-configured, meaning they wouldn't have to mess with plugging in, installing, or doing anything with an editor and, and like GitHub and a plugin and whatever else. Assume it was all pre-configured. Um, is, is there a really short video for muggles only that says, just do these couple things? Because that could be super duper useful. I think it could. The uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> okay. Um, do you think it would the, be useful? The slightly longer answer is um, partly because the world changed a little bit, and partly you know there's there's new new tech, better tech, partly because there's better tech than when Bill Anderson and I started trying to teach people Git and Markdown. Um, the situation is a little bit improved, so. It's a short script to go through um, and not much variation and not much places where you can fall down. If you just do, you mean, do these Do you things, mean to do the install or just to, 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 be, a, to be a participant? To do the install. Okay. Um, but, but I'm trying to separate the two issues entirely. I'm trying to say, hey, the install even, is a one-time event. And if we can take the pain out of that or the bite out of that, great, fine. But getting into the practice of it is, I think, the, the daily thing that would matter to bring more muggles in, no? Yeah. Um, the daily practice is harder than the install. Yeah. Um, it's not, the, the weird thing is it's not particularly hard. Um, but you have to, you have to have some dedication to the idea that you, you want to do this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then it unlocks, you know, a, an amazing, wonderful environment. But um, and so I'm, I'm enthusiastic about the potential. I'm trying to figure out how to like the, pave, so pave the, the on ramp. Yeah, I the the weird thing is, I I think Bill and I um, still discover places where 
we knew something or guessed something that you'd have to explain it to uh, a newbie, not not necessarily a muggle, just even a newbie. So today, for instance, um, in the Presfusion channel, we had a newbie. Um, he doesn't doesn't didn't know anything about Git, didn't know anything about Hack and D, didn't know anything about Markdown, doesn't know a lot of stuff. Um, so I was showing him Hack MD, and we didn't really teach him Markdown, but I told him, you know, why there's two different panes. And then the thing that I thought was really interesting was I was telling him that it was okay if he typed on this thing, right? And, you know, and, and just, there's a, there's like uh, one of the, one of the things I compared to is kids learning soccer. Mm -hmm. So there's just some body language and ball handling and stuff like that, that you don't know until you're kicking a ball around. Right. And a coach says, no, don't do that. Or, or more likely, more hopefully a player goes, you know, I don't know, you know, you didn't, you didn't get the ball because you weren't watching me when I kicked it, you should watch me. Right. Just little things like that, you know, so we were in a, a hack MD and I was playing around a little bit with Markdown, not really teaching it. And I said, hey, I'm going to make a place down at the bottom. Uh, we'll, I'll call it a section and I'll put a section header. And you notice that, you know, I, he, he said something, a, a, great, a great question, I guess. Um, the great question led into me like showing him some of the body language. The great question was, oh, cool. Are there a way to do comments? And the answer in Markdown is no, not really. <laughs> but here's the body language that we use for it, you know. So here's, you know, here's a bullet. Um, here's just a parenthetical comment. And it turns out in Markdown we don't really use comments anyway. You just type over somebody else's code. So then to do that, you make a copy of a thing that you want to change, paste it someplace else, and edit it live. You don't, you know, you don't make a comment. You just make the change. But to do that, then you have to have sections and stuff like that. So all of that, it's not hard to explain. I think he got it quickly. You know, you can explain it once. You know, here's kind of the convention for this. And you go, oh, okay. You know, it's it's a lot like, so it's it's more human than technical. And obviously humans learn human stuff well. It, and body language, things like body language and conventions, you know, you only need to get told once you know, to do it a certain way or to especially not do it a certain way because it makes everybody go, huh, and, you know. So so I feel like all of that stuff is easy to learn, easy to teach, hard to even know that it exists. So that's where we're at right now. There's a bunch of human practice stuff that's just not, you, you learn it by being part of a software development team. And right now there's no other way to learn it. Except for this fusion. Well, thank you. Um, Klaus, you had just sent a link to the what was the current draft before. Uh, I'm going to share thanks, a link. Thanks, Klaus. And oh, do you have the link already, Pete? He, I do. He just in, Pete was in already. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Perfect. Um, Good, and I wanted to see if you wanted to update. And also, uh, last time you had sent a link to a different document, uh, which was talking in colors, um, right. which is kind of related. Is that folded in here, or is that a separate thing? Yeah, <clears throat> let me uh, okay take the screen for a moment here. What the, where are we? Oh, I need to. What happened to my menu here? I don't know. Yes, we know. Here we go. <laughs> Good. Um, so the uh, yeah, so I you I have been using um, uh, pages of the book um, for to to for different reasons. So there is one here is the hydrologic and which are then which are folded into the book, but the book is too much to send to anybody, right? It's just too much information. So I picked up the hydrologic cycle here. Um, 
And this has really made quite a circle. I, I forwarded to Senator uh, uh, Merkley's office um, and uh, to to several other MOCs and to Sierra Club and uh, to to a wide network. And it's it's not that any any of this is uh, uh, unique and 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 new. You know, but what is different is that we haven't really made the connection that having millions of square miles of farmland tried out uh, has serious consequences on the hydrologic cycles, um, which is now, when you look at the conversations on LinkedIn and, and other networks, it's now taking center place. Instead of focusing on carbon, we should be focusing on this. Because you can focus on carbon as much as you want. It doesn't restore the water cycle and the water cycle turns out to be of far more important short-term impact. Mm -hmm. So that's one of these papers. And then um, here's another one that I uh, that I send around is the big story of the small water cycle that actually was sort of a precursor uh, uh, for this. And, and I also got this published in our local paper. Um, and then there was here talking in colors. And I sent this to Senator Merkley as well. Um, and to the you know, sent that around to, to uh, sort of a really selected group of people who who uh, uh, would get this, you know, not take offense and and uh, and understand what, what this really is. And so these are all embedded in the book, but I find that it's uh uh, it's better to take pieces of the book and use those you know, to for for specific communication exercises. You know? um, so so there 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 is that. Um, then you know I'm thinking at this point that we sort of have completed phase one of this. Um, you know, we got you know, we got sort of the evolutionary pathway of agriculture and its impact on on uh, humanity and and then why we need to you know revolt and change this thing and then you know why we here's the spiral wizard you now why we need to change our communications approach to unite uh, around a common story that is digestible for everyone within um within the society so for example this paper on hydrological cycle um it was deeply offensive to the green spectrum you now in the sierra club they thought it was a horrible way to talk about nature and life in the soil um but it doesn't it didn't even resonate in any form or shape in red and, and blue um because it was just like you know way too complex so it was really written for the orange spectrum, which you now is 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 important, but it's also important to understand that the story has to be like radically shifted and changed to to fit into into different uh, uh, perspectives, different different spectrums of of consciousness. And then we're talking a little bit about food as a cultural element you know you can't just uh, think of food as, as something you eat it's it has tradition and culture and uh, uh, you know social uh, relevancy that uh, that needs to be considered as well um and, and, and by the way one important part of food revolt is the introduction of bioregions and the way to thinking of uh, thinking in terms of bioregion when we restore the food system, uh, so that food has to be uh, uh, aligned with the capacity of of the bioregion to produce regeneratively, um, and then uh, talking in colors um, to to you know, put into perspective how different uh, groups think about uh, climate change, so. You know, for for you know, in the beige mem, the world is simple. is a simple, immediate place. You know, food, water, shelter, safety. Um, in purple, it still doesn't mean anything. You know, climate change and so on. And um, 
and it doesn't really even in red it doesn't uh, uh, really do anything so so it's important to to um recognize that particularly when you consider that the entire maga movement is conversa is conversations in red you know? so then you come in with climate change and it just completely bounces off into the wrong direction so anyway so then then comes here i put in visions of the future um and then leading from the emerging future and an introduction into theory you thinking uh, and so that's where where i i stopped um, um basically basically saying here in today's complex and interconnected world our traditional way of communicating for social change often falls short they either oversimplify issues or create polarized hopes making collect collective action difficult an involved understanding of human values inspired by developmental psychology and systems theory can significantly enhance the efficacy of our messages and strategies. Um, and uh, in conclusion, you know, traditional methods of communicating for social change are often not sufficient for the complex, polarized and ever-changing world we live in. What's needed is a more evolved understanding of human values that takes into account the complexity and diversity of our society. Such an approach not only allows us to create messages that resonate with a broader range of people, but also encourages the adaptability and integration that are crucial for tackling the multifaceted challenges we face. This is not merely a theoretical concept. It's practical, results-oriented strategy that has far-reaching implications for how we go about enacting meaningful social change. So that's where, where uh, I stop, and I would consider this part one, you know, or book one, um, and then transition from here into uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> you know, um, basically, you know, what? How does that translate into into uh, actionable uh, uh, ideas and steps? You know? mm -hmm. I think thinking about it as book one is a, is good for us here because that gives us a unit of of work that we can turn out as a book and then then other ideas will show up for you and that can be volume two or you know I think I think over the long run it'll conceptualize this as a multi-volume set which is terrific um I want to separate uh I want to separate the conversation about the content and the flow of content which is super important from what you said earlier about process uh, because it seemed and I think I, I think I saw Pete nod briefly it seems like you were finding your way toward, what we're sort of uh, arguing is a good way to, to do the writing, which is to disaggregate the ideas into different nuggets that live in different documents. And so you were like, yeah, the, the book got too big. And so I have this over here. But then there's a section here in the index on the left called Talking in Colors, which I thought was a different document. So my question to you is, is this version the most up-to-date version or is the one outboard in the other document the most up-to-date version? And if so, how do you reconcile or how do you want to manage the two? Because I was assuming from what you said that talking colors would be a link from here to an external document that contained the most recent version of your text but here you're, you're you've got it in line so is it because you're still liking to work with this as a one manuscript or is it for some other reason that you're not yet quite modularizing and, and extracting the chunks that might live together in a roll-up so, so the they are synonymous it's an extract um I'm, I'm simply taking a piece of the book out um and in, in fact when i write chapter you know chapters i'm putting them first into this into this format here. so you're basically copy pasting a chapter out so that you can share it with uh congress critters or other people that matter to you right. okay okay so so it's so you're doing that not to write it differently but because it's a convenience for posting it in, or sharing it in other ways yeah, it's just it's just too much to hand them on this whole book. You know? oh, okay, and, but there are pieces of the book that are really uh, that are really deep. In in in, I mean, this this thing communicates at an IQ of one hundred and fifty five. You know, and you, you read this. I mean, I obviously didn't write a whole lot of it. You know, I mean, this is amazing stuff, um, and and so. Um, it's 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 overwhelming to someone who hasn't dealt with it 
Uh, it's just it's just uh, way too much information. So, but there are pieces that fit into a given conversation, mm -hmm. you know. And so that and and so this kind of modular use of the book uh, uh, could be very useful, could be practical. Cool. Um, and to play out a bit of what Pete was saying about prose fusion and what I'm saying about neo books. Like if the nuggets exist as web pages that are editable in a wiki format, but they exist as web pages, then all you need to do instead of copy pasting and sending somebody a Google Doc is you can send somebody a link to a web page, yeah, which which could exist as an essay, but that essay gets rolled up into a book. Um, Pete, do you want to add anything to what I'm what I'm saying? Um, yeah, please. Um. Looks it looks really good, Klaus. Um, and Jerry, you're totally right that if you make each chunk into a web page, then it's easy to move around. And then I have to kind of also observe that um, we've we've trained people that a web page a web page might be super fascinating, but probably most of the thousands of web pages you've you've seen in your life are pretty dull and boring. So as as soon as it becomes a web page, I think it's harder to pay attention to or, or take seriously. It's hard to say. So you, you show somebody a web page, it's one of probably a trillion web pages, right? It's like, okay, I get the value of this. This is somewhere between, you know, spam and important. And there's another trillion web pages I look I can look at and it's like, I don't know if it's important or not. Are so, you arguing when, for presentation in Google Docs? Nope, I'm arguing for presentation in PDF actually. Ah, <clears throat> sorry, that just hurt. Hmm. Really? I mean, I can see that um, a congressman might pay attention a personal, to a PDF, a personalized email. Um, yeah. So, you know, a, a personalized email with the same content is a step up. And um, counterintuitively, um, uh, somebody that's gone through the, um, we'll come back maybe to why that's counterintuitive, but somebody that's gone through the process of making this into a little publication, a PDF, they've curated something for you to look at rather so look, than- I, Look, I made this PDF for you? I just copied and pasted this and it's spam from the web and you should read it because it's super important and I really loved it. You know, we, we all get much more of that than we need already. So you're busy hacking the open rate or interest rate of the reader, of a particular kind of reader in your what you're saying right now. Indeed. Okay. But, uh, but I think it's a general class of reader and I think it's, you know, 60% of people or something. Oh, I get PDFs. I hate them. Like, just hate them. I, I think you're one of the, you know, outliers. Percent. Yeah. Um, and there's another, you know, there's another question. Like ten years ago, if you sent somebody a PDF, it was hit or miss whether or not they could even be able to see it. Right. But right. nowadays, with modern email systems, it's pretty. You know, you click on it and you see it. You may not be able to do anything with it. You may not know how you saw it. You might have trouble getting back to your email client. Right. But you'll see the PDF. Um, fascinating, Klaus. Any thoughts? Yeah, I I, I like that idea. I think it's. Uh... Think of the audience we're dealing with, right? I mean, you, you really want to approach people who are not necessarily uh, super technical inclined. You know, a lot of the, um, of like in our generation, a lot of people are sort of very marginal in the way that they interact with technology. So a PDF is pretty easy to, to get around with. And this is what it says here. It's about effectiveness now. Um, key metrics, engagement, behavioral change, policy impact, adaptability. I, I can say something about document management too. And Klaus, I don't mean, I'm, I'm going to say something and I don't mean to say that you should do anything differently. <laughs> You're doing a great job and more power to you. Um, and then I can also kind of say this would be a lot easier in Massive Wiki or you know ProseFusion than in Google Docs. 
modulo that that you know the the speed bump at the beginning but once you've got over that speed bump managing so why, managing yeah, why, chunks and you know different versions of chunks assembling chunks all of that becomes a lot easier um now at this point klaus is showing it to us but i'm not doing a lot of active editing any active editing of the document nor are you i think um, so this is not a, a collaborative writing project yet, except for Klaus's collaborations with ChatGPT. Um, I don't I don't know how or why this would be easier in Massive Wiki. Um, yeah, it, maybe maybe that's fair. I I can I can project a little bit. Um, uh, keeping each, each of these things as a separate file on your computer, I think is easier than Google Docs. Um, and that's, that's maybe a pretty bold statement. Um, if you're good at Google Docs, then it's, it's just going to work. But I guess even then, I don't know, the Google Docs is going to limit the, the, um, uh, working with files on your computer, I think, is is easier than working in Google Docs. Uh, what if I want to have two or three or ten of these files together? What if I want to, on my computer, if I had all, each of these as a separate file um, and I wanted to send this one, this one, and this one to somebody, I'd go click, 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 and drag it over to my email thing, right? Instead of trying to find the link or exporting or anything like that. I don't know. It's just... File management is is easier on a computer. Huh. So if we say, okay, here we got volume one, um, let's lock it down. Then that seems to be, and, and let's do this on PDF, right? So you you put this aside, so you don't you don't edit any further. Uh, I mean, this is uh, so it's sort of closed down, and then you you dress it out. So it's identifiable uh, as a as a neo book. Uh, probably put a disclaimer on it or you know, copyright statement and all of those things on there. Um, so it has some official context. Would that make sense now? I I think so. I would. Um, a, a couple observations. One thing is I think. Um, book is kind of a useful organizing something, or neo book is a neo book is maybe even more useful. It looks to me like you don't have a book. It looks like you have um, a set of, you know, a set of mini essays. So you have something that we don't have a word for. I think neo book, <laughs> and, and yeah, neo book is a good way to call it. So. So then in a neo book, you'd have a, actually, you know, we're kind of back where we started with chat books or something like that, or um, they call them uh, edited volumes or whatever they call them. You've, it's, it's more like you've got a, a set of monographs, right? Um, uh, and you want to be able to deploy different ones to different places. And, you know, you could call the whole thing a volume, but, that it kind of, when you call it a book, it kind of like reduces the utility of it in a way, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, so so then to your, your point, um, in the prose fusion world, you wouldn't exactly lock it down. What you would do is you would say, all of these things together, I'm going to, I'm gonna give it a, a version number. So this is version 1.0.0. Um, uh, and then you could publish, you know, small changes as version 1.0.1 1 .1 or, you know, even the numbers, those three numbers have different meanings for what the digits are. So, um, so then somebody could say, you know, oh, I read your book. I love it. And you'd say, what version do you have? I, it sounds like you're, you're parroting back something that I, I wanted to take it take out and they would say well i've got 1.3.5 it's like oh you need 1.5.0 um and that you know clears up that confusion entirely so i think 
I think that's what I would do is, is make it a version. Um, and you, we can talk about whether or not those three digits make, make sense as versions. It could be version one, version two, version three, or, you know, in uh, publishing terms, it's, you know, published 1995, published 1997, published 2001. Um, you'd probably want a day or a month instead of a year, but, um, uh, but yes, just thing, you know, saying this is a version and then putting the, the standard publication, you know, copyright and, and stuff. You, you're there pretty much. Okay. And also, I mean, I do consider this collaborative, Jerry. I mean, I know you didn't write directly, but we had multiple <laughs> meetings where I, I reassembled content, I added content because what we did in the conversations is basically you and Stuart highlighting, yeah, I don't get what you're talking about or this doesn't seem to make sense or you're missing something here, right? And so it was collaborative. So, so I totally agree with that. It was collaborative at the conversational level, but not at the document management and editing level. So you have done all the changes to the document. <clears throat> we have talked a lot about the content of the document and made suggestions and, and you've done a, a tremendous uh, amount of work on it. Um, so all I was saying was that um, the collaborative document part of it, not so much. It's just, it might, you know, it might as well be you working in whatever your favorite tool is and then uh, spitting it out. Um, and a, a couple things. Um, and I'm really wrestling with my reactions here um, as Pete is intuiting, except for the last thing Pete said about versioning, everything else that just came up feels like two giant steps backward. And if we were to just squeeze this out as a PDF and publish that out in the world, it would not be a neo book in any way that I'm conceiving of a neo book at all. Uh, and I would want to not have it be a neo book. Uh, so, so that's what I'm wrestling with is that the neo book is actually connected nuggets that are alive and, and contextual that happen to roll up into a book. And if it's a book or a pamphlet or whatever, and if it goes out as PDF or EPUB is not a big deal. Um, but it, I thought it would be elegant to play this through as an EPUB or Kindle direct book so that we could say, hey, this is a neo book and it is book like, and some books are relatively short. Like there's some very good books that are not very long. And that's kind of what I was, what I was hoping and aiming for. But the nuggetization of it is essential to the neo book and the existence of the nuggets in some lively fashion where the nuggets are more interesting than the dry uh, snapshot of the PDF or the ebook is essential. And not having any of those things, it would not be a neo book. Does that make sense? Makes, makes a ton of sense. And we got into a particular point about PDFs, which I did not mean to overstate. Um, so you and I don't disagree, um, I, I, I believe. Uh, if I want to send somebody a nugget, if I want to send a congressperson a nugget from a neo book, <laughs> I'm going to send it by email as a PDF. Which I would agree with at some point eventually. And that's and, and, but, that's why I, but that's why I asked you the specific question. Hey, it sounds like you're hacking the audience here for how to deliver content. Yes. That's yes. why I asked that question. Yes. So okay. we don't disagree. But, that, but that's a very narrow aspect of what this project I would hope is. Um, it's, yes an, it's, no. an important, it's an important item for Klaus right now because that's how he's using the content. Well... To to I it's it's not I think it's not as narrow maybe as you think. Um, if I want to send it to not somebody in Congress, but if I want to send it to somebody in Greenpeace, or if I want to send it to a farmer, or if I want to send it to my city council, or if I want to send it to my mom, so, I'm okay. still emailing a PDF and I'm I'm picking a nugget. I'm not sending her the whole thing. So. My way of doing that would be every nugget would have a little widget that we could create that would say, hey, I need to send this to a muggle that's not going to understand what to do. Turn this turn this nugget into a PDF. And by the way, at the bottom of the PDF, put a little live link that says, hey, you can go visit this thing online if you want to be brave and go try the wild and woolly internet. 
And there's more information and resources and conversations around this nugget online. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then, and then the PDF would be the transmission method for the people that you're assuming would prefer to see a PDF. And the little wid widget could say, now here's a, a place to customize it so that this person feels like it, it has their name printed in the PDF. This, this is this nugget for uh, so-and-so destination Congress critter, et cetera. You could, you could really dress this up to feel more special, et cetera. And that would just be a matter of code. Um, and I, and I would find that completely like in line with with what a neo book, with how a neo book could be used, in particular because we would then be we the writer trying to communicate with other people would be working with the nuggets and then sending them out to make them visible. Um, I totally agree. With one small comment, which is the part where it says down at the bottom, here's a, a live link. In, in case you're, you know, really really uh, crazy, you could use this thing called the web and, mm -hmm. and go to this thing, and you'll find. So I would say very little beyond that. <laughs> the whole, oh, I, you know, I, I, more information, fine. blah, 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 you know, yeah. chat, blah, blah, blah. Because just even that, um, you know, that that could lead to overwhelm really easily. It could just say, hey, here's this document on the web. That's it. Yeah. And That'd be, I'd be fine with that. It, it also dilutes what you're trying to say. So, for example, when I send to the Sierra Club this thing about the hydrologic cycle, that's all I wanted to talk about, you know? And if I had introduced any other topic, then it would have gone poof. Yeah. But this way you keep them focused you now on this is this is what we're talking about here. Um, so, so that'll so, be a little checkbox on, on Jerry's widget thing um, that says these people can tolerate a web link. These people don't want a web link. Yeah. Yeah. I, to, to rewind, uh, Jerry, I, I, I don't disagree with anything you've said, I think. Um, Klaus, to rewind a little bit to where we are in the publication process, I, I skipped over a thing that I think is really important. Um, uh, and, and I don't, we just didn't talk about it. The three of us just didn't talk about it, but I, it's an obvious uh, elephant in the room. I would convert this to a different format, to a publication format. Um, and the publication format should not be PDF. And you know it shouldn't be Docx or or um, or Google Docs or whatever. So I hope that make that's not controversial. <laughs> so then the the Good document copy. the the format choices are Docx is almost a format choice, but it's a really really bad one, really brittle. Um, so kind of your choices are HTML and Markdown. Um, I think there's other ones you could use like LaTeX or restructured text or things like that, but they get even more specialist than Markdown or HTML. Um, so I, I think that's a, a, a next pass is to get it either into Markdown or HTML before, you know, so that's, that's where you say I'm done drafting. I want to start moving towards PDFs and EPUBs and web pages and all that. Between drafting and publishing the final formats is a archival format, Markdown or HTML, I think. So obviously, you know, you're leaving me in the dust with the technology here. I mean, I, I had to wrestle myself into uh, Chat GPT 4.0, <laughs> which you which you've done beautifully, by the way. And uh, but it, these are all push-ups, you know. And uh, reminds me that I'm 73 years old here, guys. I, it, it's it's not your job. This this part is not your job. Um, I'm so glad you said this, Pete. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I you I mean, you know you're the author, right? Uh, and maybe the publisher or something like that. Uh, you you're not you don't have to do. I you're not the you're not the printer. You're not you know this is I'm talking printing press stuff. I'm not talking right. And it's and it's really interesting. So kind of what's happening here because Klaus, I think I think that the moment Pete or I say, hey, roll this out as Markdown files in a GitHub repo for us. That does not mean the end of touching and editing the document. That means the beginning of collaborating with other people in this marvelous way that Pete is trying to do with Prose Fusion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For you, it very likely means, well, I'm gonna kiss that document goodbye and I'll go back and work on a you know book two in, in Google Docs. 
And so there's this really interesting kind of parting of the ways that might happen. And, and it would be pretty easy, I think, for Pete or I manually or programmatically to take your major headings in the index of this Google Doc and spit out each of the major headings as a nugget that's a markdown file. Like that, you know, we would you would probably lose some formatting, but that the conversion is not that hard. These things would live happily as you know separate markdown units, and then there would be one. Uh, you, uh, there would be one markdown file which would act as the table of contents that would roll all those up, uh, you know, with links. And that that was that's not that's not you know difficult to do. But but it causes it throws this wrench in the works because I think for you it freezes the document, and that's not our intention. Our intention is that the documents, once modularized, are richer, more interesting, more lively, more whatever. And and I'm sorry that that's happening, and I don't know how to resolve it. No, no. I mean, this is. I, I'm. I mean, my 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 uh, point here would be this talking in colors, right? Because we need to be conscious of what what audience we're reaching, and so if we have, we sort of have a tendency, OGM uh, speaking. To to talk to you know folks who uh, are uh, in the orange green range you know may, but have a, a complex understanding of yellow and so um, you know they they get this but the challenge is to talk with people who uh, are not on board and and who who um, need to uh, be addressed with a language that is that is speaking to their invite to their consciousness, you no, know, to their environment, to their vocabulary. No. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this book is not something that somebody in red is going to pick up, read, and enjoy. I think this book talks about at a meta level, how do we communicate with a bunch of different people at different levels in spiral in the spiral dynamics model. Right. I, I can see that if ChatGPT could ingest the size of a book that it is, there could be a query to ChatGPT, hey, um, express this book in a way that that somebody in red would uh, would love. And that you could, would, absolutely, and, you could. Uh, and that would be a book would, with a different title, almost you the have same to, content. You have to train uh, 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 chat for that. So I did a few experiments yeah. and came out garbage. Um, you, you really think, need to... Uh, you really need to spend time with with uh, with the AI to uh, to trim this into something that that comes out right that makes sense because it it just goes weird on you you know yeah. and, and, um, but uh, so I'm not quite there yet to I mean that that's just like a whole different work effort I'm really wanting to to move into um, where do we what do we do what are the what are the levers right what are the two or three things that we can really focus on and and bring home right and I mean just to not uh, bug you with too much technical detail but there are two levers right um, one is meat markets so the the there are basically four international companies that dominate 90 percent of the U.S. meat market and they have systematically taken out all the small abattoirs, you know, slaughterhouse capacities. So small farmers can't get into a USDA approved uh, facility to process the animals, which is a major impediment, you know, because uh, the meat is the most uh, uh, profitable part of a multi multi crop uh, farm you know, with integrated livestock. And it's also from an environmental perspective, the best way to raise animals, because first of all, it's humane, you know, and then they, you feed them with local with, with products that you have on your own farm already anyways, right? So that's one thing. And then the other thing is uh, brokerage, you know, to connect, uh, uh, to, to, re, to, re, to restore the uh, cooperative movement that was dominating the agricultural business until they killed it, you know? And so a co a cooperatives combine 50, 100, 200 farmers under an umbrella, they negotiate with high volume contracts with wholesale accounts and then distribute them amongst their farmers, their participating farmers. So if they need a thousand acres of carrots, you get 50, you get 80, you get 100 acres, right? Until And then they consolidate this uh, and, and ship it out. And so that has gotten lost. If you do these two things, you can revolutionize the American food business. Now, and so that's where I want to focus on next. Now. 
Um, and uh, are the things you just said in the text of this manuscript so far? Not at this all. The, the so I think book. I think you're describing book two. Yeah, exactly. Yes. yes. Um, which which is terrific because book one like sets the groundwork and what's the appetite and says here's some strategies and book two says okay here's some things you could do and you're off and running. And so I love that. Yeah. Um, if if I you, may, please. Um, uh, two things come to mind. Um, and Klaus, I love the the idea of that book too. Um, I I wonder if Talking on Colors is already a second book. Well, is, Talking is in there, Colors, the way we've been framing it so far. And a, and a Spiral Dynamics book? So the, or the, the, it, way, the way we've been Is it all of a about, piece? Sorry, Pete. Um, the way we've been thinking about it so far is that um, Klaus is applying Spiral Dynamics to the framework of the book and the goals of the book. And that is this particular this particular book is applied applying spiral dynamics to the problem of regenerative agriculture and how to communicate that. Okay, Got there it. could be there could be a parallel book which is applying theory U to the same exact problem, and that would be a different book. We don't. It really know. starts here, Pete. Yeah, we actually had a, a lot of discussion around it with Stuart and Jerry um, to to make this sensible. It really starts here to say because you know what 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 the hell is this? Because it's, it hasn't been used this way, spiral dynamics. People are sort of aware of it, but it hasn't been used in this in, in the way we're doing it here. And so we go through um, how does it work, what is what is it supposed to, to achieve, and so on, um, engaging you know, through the process of reforming our minds, and you go through that part. And then I asked, uh, uh, so then you go, you know, how do we, how, do, how, how have we historically dealt with communicating insights in a course of action. And then I wanted to, to say, okay, so how do you now, what does this now look like you know, in some more specificity? How do you frame these individual colors? So I was asking here, right, and on essay, what does the world look like to an, to an individual living in their respective VMIM zone? Considering the information this group has access to and knows to process, what are they thinking? Who are their thought leaders operating at a higher level of consciousness? What are the motivations of these thought leaders for engaging with a specific VMAM, right? Thinking about how red is being manipulated by orange. What is the most recent state of cognitive dissonance caused by the divergence of talking about climate change versus observing it in real life? And that just came out super interesting because you realize that beige and uh, purple and red and even blue, they don't have cognitive dissonance, you know, because they have no clue what's going on. They can't even process it. And so, so blue has some for, has some cognitive resonance, resonance uh, dissonance, I mean. Um, but then orange is really stressed out, right? So that's where you start. And orange is really stressed out because they know they're screwing this thing up. They understand the science. And they're determined to do it anyway, and it's getting more and more difficult to deal with it. You know? So, so that that sort of, I mean, it's really interesting uh, stuff that I mean, I could have never thought of, right? I mean, but here you have an intelligence that you're interacting with, you know, that's just like wow, <laughs> it's incredible. If, if, um, Jerry, you want to go, or I'll remember what I have to say. Go ahead. Um, if I may, um. Part of my concern is is looking at the the old title, the story of soil. Um, I think Jerry captured it well. He said this book is uh, kind of explaining how how to communicate um, soil or water to different audiences through a lens of spiral dynamics. So if that's what the book is about. It's awesome, and I I appreciate that it hasn't been done before, and I'm glad somebody's doing it. That's that's different though than the story of soil, right? Um, so unless you use the story of soil as a small kind of like seed around which you can talk about the communication strategy of you know social change, I I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want much of a book that's at one at a subject level and then a meta subject level. I wouldn't want them to be the, I would want those to be two separate books. Um, does that make sense? 
Um, let me add a thing quickly here because I love what you just said and I want to combine what both of you said a moment ago, which is there I can easily envision a spin-out book um, called something like Applied Spiral Dynamics. Which and Klaus, you're saying nobody's done this before. We could certainly do more research and figure out if anybody's sort of been doing this. But the that, but the idea that you're picking up spiral dynamics and turning it into a way to communicate and a PR strategy and a communications plan is cool. And if it's unique and new, that's a, that's a book on its own. And that book could even contain, as a case study, the talking and colors section here, which is very specifically how do we talk about regenerative agriculture and water and soil to these different audiences in the colors that could just be that could just be a random case study in a book about spiral dynamics and that could be a separate neo book that you wouldn't actually have to do that much to fix but it would be targeted at a completely different audience and it would it would only be about spiral dynamics it wouldn't have the, the front matter about the story of soil and water and all that kind of stuff so that that's kind of cool and exciting um and then I think that we haven't we haven't had the conversation about what should the actual title of the book be once it, once you're done, and I think it's clear that that spiral dynamics or something like that because of the approach and because of how much of the content it is needs to be reflected uh, in the title as Pete was just saying. And so I, I, I'm seeing the story of soil as a placeholder title. It could be a subtitle, a subhead, a piece of it. It could be the major chapter heading for the first half of the book. I don't know, uh, but I think it fits slightly differently than we've got it right now. Well, spiral dynamics has been used by Cambridge Analytica, for example, right? And it's being used by Heritage Foundation and, and uh, by Russia, <laughs> you know, because that's how they communicate. And that's how they have such an iron grip you know, on the so website. You, you, the you, are, you are writing the introduction to that book right now as you speak. <laughs> uh, because, yeah. because, because each of those is sort of, sort of covert. And what you're going to do is say, hey, this needs to be made more explicit, and here's how. I love yeah. it. And then the other thing is, Pete, I mean, to, to your point, there are audiences where you couldn't send this book with the inclusion of spiral dynamics because they would consider it offensive. Yeah. You know, they, I mean, they, they would, because they would automatically feel ranked here, and people hate being put into this ranking box you now. Which, hey, which, mostly, I wonder if you have how many books you have. So each of the nuggets is not really what I'm talking about. Maybe the, maybe those are chapters or something like that. But, but if you've got, so you've definitely got meta content. You've got content about how to present the base level content to different you know successfully to different social audience uh, different in different social ways right so that meta content it's it's kind of like um uh in high school or university that meta strategy book would be the teacher's workbook right here's how you teach the course using the textbook so I'm just I'm just trying to make sure that you don't have the textbook and the advanced teacher's workbook in the same book. I think they should be separate, if that makes sense. So, so I mean, these are all uh, great discussions, um, which which really shows there's a whole a whole next level work effort that that needs to happen, right? Um, for me. I mean, I think it's pants on fire kind of time, right? Yep. And um, I have uh, a meeting on Friday with a uh, with a PhD from Seattle who has doctoral studies underway, and he's interested in maybe funding something I'm I like to work on in the community. I just got connected with the Kiss the Ground guys, you know, John Ulak and and Finian. Um, and they they are in they you know uh, looked at what I just did here in Bend with this uh, local event, which is like it, it's a form of focus group research that uh, um, hasn't been really recognized so much as qualitative research. But the data that came out of this meeting we had here in Bend is so valuable. You know, it's absolutely fantastic, um, and I mean it, it uh, and it's completely 
community based, you know, because each community has so has such different dynamics because of different actors involved. And, you know, you have to really bring people that are that are engaged together and they may come from completely different backgrounds in one community versus another. I mean, for example, the Sierra Club in Bend, all they want to do is go on hikes, nature walks, right? And then you go to the next place and these guys are on fire, you know, uh, engaging in agriculture and, you know, legislation and what have you. So so you really need to go community specific. So that's cool. So that's that's where I want to, to focus my attention. So <clears throat> this has been a phenomenal, uh, phenomenally helpful exercise for me to focus my thoughts and to get support, really. I mean, this this AI is kick-ass amazing in structuring your thoughts and, and adding to it in ways that you would have never thought of. You know? yep. And so um, I have no idea how to do it yet, but I like to carry this over now to this next implementation too. And this is a theory you approach. I mean, you know, I've been following theory you for years. And so now, you know, this is a crystallizing understanding right here. So we have crystallized the issues, but now we uh, we, we go into into prototyping. Mm -hmm. So we we now need to. So what do you do prototype? What are the most important outcomes that you can imagine would be most helpful and achievable in all of that? Right. So so that's where so so that's where I want to go is guide prototyping thoughts. Uh, and and hope and maybe even engage personally in some of those experiments. Um, small side note: the theory U component of this book started to grow recently, and I think it might grow enough to be part of this title subtitle complex. Meaning, you know, uh, addressing addressing water and soil for regeneration via spiral dynamics and theory U, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh... Uh, where I'm where over here, it's like, see, yeah, I haven't fleshed that out yet. Uh, this actually deserves it or its own lead in page and graphic introduction. Right. Um, yeah, leading from the emerging future, of course, is a is a uh, key slogan that Otto Sharma uh, uh, invented. Uh, and I love this here. Leadership essentially is not what a person or an individual does. That's the biggest misunderstanding. The essence of leadership is the capacity of the system in which everyone is participating to sense and shape the future and to be in touch with what is wanting to emerge and then stepping into that, right? I mean, I, I just, that just this whole theory you thing is just amazing. Yeah. Um, Klaus, I hear you and I agree with you, pants on fire. It's time to get this out. And, <laughs> um, uh, I think, so I, I think, you know, whatever you can do, we can do to help get it out ASAP is, is a right thing to do. Additionally, there's kind of a longer, longer timeline thing that could happen. One of those, I, so now, now like the author is kind of done with the work, um, and at this point, I think in a regular book publishing scenario, it would be a good time to have production editorial, look at the whole thing um, and, you know, kind of change, change things to not change content, but change some of the, the presentation. A thing that stood out for me right away, right, uh, uh, was the chat GPT question, the prompt that you've got to, to create the content. Um, I love that you did that. And I think it's gonna be a big distraction for most people. So as a production editorial staff member, what I would say is, um, hey, let's it, that happens over and over in the book. It's great. I think it's important to keep that content. Let's hide it a little bit from um, regular readers. We'll put a footnote here. You know, here's a footnote that goes to the appendix of all the the ChatGPT prompts. So that kind of stuff, you know, just let's let's take the presentation and kick it up a notch uh, in book book pub production. Basically, it's a production step. Um, 
also about at this time in a regular book, I think what they would do is, I forget the name of it even, but they make a preview book out of this, one of the big thick Xerox copies of galleys. the book, galleys. So they send out galleys to, you know, 20 of your closest friends and a few editors, right? Um, so I personally, and, you know, personally, I would take, the book at this stage and I would say um, I'm done I've done what I wanted to do it says what I want to do uh, I personally I wouldn't call this version 1.0 I would call this version 0.9 I would send galleys out to to people and say hey mark this up work with my editor um, you know if you see something that I, that should be expressed differently if you didn't understand what the meme is and we need more footnotes about it if i need to write another section about you know v memes and spiral dynamics you know all that kind of stuff i would go through that that process to to bring it from the eyes of, of you know a few people um to the eyes of another bigger circle 20 people or so um through that process of the thoughts I actually started getting sick uh, you know, a couple of days, a few days ago, because I think I just totally overloaded myself. You know? yeah. And I was yesterday, I slept the entire day. I was just out. You know? And so I have to be a little bit careful managing my own, uh, my own energy you now. Um, and then, and then I'm going to be gone again for two weeks. I'm going to Mexico. So in the next two weeks I'm gone. Um, I mean, would it be, would it be okay, since this is a, you know, meant to be a collaborative project, to hand this over from here, and then I step back from it? You know, of course, uh, if you want me to do anything, update or change or whatever, I'll do that. But step back from it, and then and then you just uh, form it in in a way that uh, f matches the vision of a neo book. Yeah. Um, I that's exactly right, and and. Yeah, this is this is where you've sent off your final draft, and now I think it's the the editorial and production team that takes over and project manages all of that stuff, right? What format should this have to be? You know, how are we going to paginate it? Uh, you know, what does what does the overall book? You know, what size is it? All that kind of technical stuff, right? That's not an author's job. That's the production staff, editorial staff, publishing staff. What we don't have on hand is in particular, um, I mean, there's many things we don't have on hand because we're sort of DIYing this, but we don't have uh, the writing editor, basically the day-to-day -day editor who, who you would send a manuscript to and who would then like read it front to back to make sure that there's continuity, that the topics come up properly, that, that the whole thing actually like smells like a book. And we don't, we don't have one of those. So, so the galley, um, phase that Pete was just describing would come mostly after that. You and your editor would first go through a couple cycles where you're happy with the book. Then it goes out for blind peer review is is like uh, what normally happens uh, as not even galleys. But it's basically a, a review copy. Uh, galleys are like when you're just about ready to... Galleys, I think, are when the finished book has been sent to the printer, but it's not quite done yet. So you have a couple of nicely bound, of like uh, temporarily bound books that you send to people and say, hey, read this and give me a review uh, before it actually publishes on July 24th or whatever. Um, so we don't have that person. We don't have somebody who's going to do... And it's a bunch of work to do a critical read front to back of a book and offer useful suggestions to to sort of turn it into a book or useful prompts back to you, Klaus, to say, hey, there's there's a, like a hole between this topic and this topic. Could you write a bridge? Or and I think that's what that's what's still needed. I don't I don't know that we have a finished manuscript here, and I haven't had the time to read it front to back. Um, so we need to either uh, Klaus, you could you could hire an editor temporarily for one project and say, hey, can you help us turn this into a book? I don't know what that would cost. I imagine it's a few thousand dollars, but that's possible. I think we're trying to MacGyver this and crowdsource this. So maybe skipping straight to the galleys phase will kick up a couple people who do a careful read. And sometimes that happens. Uh, that It could be that you send 15 galleys out and one or two of the people you sent to were like, wow, this was, I love this topic, but I found a bunch of stuff that needs fit. And that's the person you want, right? Um, but in, in the book publishing business, there's actually a person who gets paid and whose role it is to sit down and 
slowly go through it and actually like do the crafting. Um, we could also publish something that isn't that crafted and just see how the whole mechanism works and, and, and kind of skip the feedback if it doesn't show up in the galley sharing phase. Go ahead, Pete. I, I think that galley sharing phase is actually pretty important. I, which is not to yeah, say that I wouldn't, I wouldn't just publish it. You know, I think it's okay to publish it. I think maybe, maybe what I would do in the front front matter, you know, I'd have a, um, kind of like one of those fun drive thermometers or something, you know, where it says, we think this book is at, at version 0 0.9. Uh, we're interested, you know, it's, it's not quite fully baked, but we want to rush, rush print it basically. Um, so take that in mind and we're looking for, you know, we're looking for feedback. So please get in touch with us if you are interested in, in a little bit, um, you know, deeper. So I think Jerry, my guess is, Partly for, partly for some of the reasons Klaus just said, he's got to manage his energy. Right. And partly process-wise, this is where the NeoBooks team has to figure out how to lift the, the, that project. At, at this point, it's actually project management, right, of that editorial process and stuff like that. Who's, who's seen it? Who wants to see it? Who's made what comments where? All that kind of stuff. That's not something that... Uh, not something authors would typically do, not something that authors have a lot of energy for. And, and Klaus, the, the author is going to be way too close to the material anyway, right? Part of the editorial process is getting more eyes, varied eyes from different viewpoints and shaking it out to, before you release it to everybody. So I, I, for various reasons, I, I think maybe between you and me, Jerry, um, we need to emulate a project management function and then that review process function. Um, and I think crowdsourcing it rather than, I, well, unless somebody has a, thousand, a couple thousand dollars, two thousand dollars laying around, right. um, I, I think it's fine to try to crowdsource that um, uh, and and ask people for favors, probably. Hey, this is an important thing. You know, we need some feedback. Um, can you do that for us? I, I think that the three of us can share those share the lift in the sense that okay. I think it's important for. Uh, I think if Klaus writes a, a brief intro that says some of the stuff that you just said, Pete, that's about the draft and what condition it's in and and how feedback could be dealt with and all that, or we could we could draft something for that uh, and Klaus can like check off on it, and then we we basically spit spit this out as a PDF and send it to people as a as an editable draft. Now the problem with sending the, it to them as a PDF is that then all edits are manual. Uh, who knows how the the very the the comments come back? I, that 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 that's its own little funny issue, but I think it's important to get the draft in front of people that Klaus knows who would be willing to give it a read. And then I think it's also important to get it in, in front of people that Klaus doesn't know that we could probably find in some way. So I think I think that those are complementary groups of of potential readers. And I don't think we're talking about you know more than ten people total. Uh, of whom maybe half might read the manuscript. I, you have to you have to count on the fact that about, some people are going to say sure, sure, and then never get to it. Um, I, I would try to hit fifteen people and expect two or three. That uh, that sounds good. Um, and the, the the thing about peer review with an official book is that those people are actually sort of contracted to do a peer review of a book, and they do. They they come back with their comments, so it's much more professional, reliable, etc. So we're again we're, we're MacGyvering here. Um, but I think that's doable. I I like that. I I think Jerry, you and I should do it, and Klaus shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, I would. I mean, honestly, uh, um, I mean, I'm I'm so overcommitted. It's it's crazy, you know. Um, you know, right now, I mean, they want me to write uh, uh, something for the local Republican MOC, and you know, it's just I, I just really have to uh, um, condense my my focus um, because I literally, I mean, I was just when I came back after vacation, you know, I just jumped in it with two feet, and then I crashed on Friday. You know, I was just oh, really, yeah. 
I was just completely out. Um, my so my rationale for for what it's worth, I and makes sense, total sense, Klaus. During my rationale is that this is actually uh, you and I can do that work not under the billing code of uh, the story of soil or whatever, but under the billing code of new book process. Um, this is something that you and I kind of need to document as a process. And Klaus probably does, has very little interest in documenting <laughs> that process. Mm -hmm. um, documenting as a process, uh, it's part of the tiles of, of work that needs to be done. And then we can take that documented process and say, you know, we can hire for it, we can fundraise against it, all that kind of stuff. It's so I, I guess what I'm what I'm suggesting is not so much that we need to do a particular chunk of work, but we need to document how the work would be done while we're doing mm -hmm. it so that we can sell it and fund it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree. That sounds great. And I'm going to I'm going to be in Mexico in Cabo for, for 10 days. So I'm going to start consolidating my thoughts on you know, how to tackle this next line of thinking you know, about you know, where's the action? How do you frame it? How do you set it up you know, so that people get what you're talking about? The historic perspective of uh, you know, how markets have evolved in the United States and where they are today and so on. And, uh, so, so I'm already starting to to to, to get a little. But, but honestly, yesterday, even yesterday, I had like one big plank page you know, to not even uh, where the where the heck do I go with this? But then things sort of once you start focusing on something, things sort of start falling into place. Mm -hmm. you know, simply by point putting your eyes in that direction. So, so that's sort of what's happening. Cool. That sounds like it'll work. Thank you so much, you know, Peter. I love, I love your your uh, input. You know, it's just so timely. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks um, for showing up on this call. I I showed up because Klaus said, "Hey, nice mid journey images. We should, you know, they should be in a, in a neo book at some point." Um. So maybe we could talk, talk about, about that? that a little bit. Yeah. Want to talk about um, that? Sure. What what images might be useful and what style and stuff. Um, I have to say that you, it's hard to get mid-journey to do the right thing. Um, the way that I do mid-journey, I, I think there's two ways to do mid-journey. You generate hundreds of images and pick the few that, that are actually what you want. <laughs> um, kind of like an amateur photographer, you know, you, you shoot thousands of frames and, you know, you get two or three good ones. Um, the other way that you use it in a professional setting, a professional artist, I think what he or she's going to be doing is using mid-journey a lot for brainstorming and mocks and stuff like that. And then for final images, they'd probably generate, you know, three, five, 10, 20 different images and literally copy and paste them all together and Photoshop them together, right? If you, mm -hmm. if you want a specific image, mid-journey doesn't give you a specific image. It gives you lots of creativity, kind of like chat GPD now that I think about it. So um, having said that, um during um ai 101 this morning I, another thing that i'm leading uh we were doing mid journey and it turned out um one of one of the participants had a great question pete i'm trying to get a, essentially a stock photo of scientists lab coats beakers blah right and for the life of me i can't get you know test tubes and beakers and you know it's like it skitters all over the place um, and I can't get what I want. How do you do that? And so I told the story, well, <laughs> make 500 images and pick the, the two best ones or be a professional artist and know how to use Photoshop out of 20 images. There's another one which actually worked amazingly well. Um, I've never done it before and I felt a little weird about it. So let me run this past you. Um, it, it also, turns you out, the screen? what's up? Klaus, do you want to stop screen sharing? Thanks. Um, it turns out that you can do a search, however you want to do a search, you know, stock photos, um, science lab, white coats, 
test tubes, blah. So then you get a bunch of stock photo things from the various stock, even the stock places. They're all copyrighted. They're not for reuse, which is fine. That's, that's wonderful. So I don't want to use them. And I've actually stopped myself personally. I don't even touch anything that's not mine. So any source material I'm feeding to mid journey, it's photographs from my, you know, from me, not anything from the web. So this was the first time I realized. So there's a thing that you do in mid journey. You say, Hey, mid journey, here's an image. Tell me what prompt you would use to generate images like this works hmm. really well. I've been doing that with photos and it's super fun, um, super creative, super interesting. Super interesting. But of course you can do the same thing with a stock photo. So, uh, during AI 101 is like, okay, this is kind of what we were looking for. Midjourney described this to us. Um, so that's the the dirty feeling part of of it. You know, it's like, oh, we're kind of looking at somebody else's work, and but literally, what what uh, Midjourney says is, maybe I'll share my screen and we can try to find it if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, we were in, oops, I went too far. Uh, so this is a stock image that we picked, Alani. Um, I appreciate that they own it, um, but I also have free use rights to look at it and maybe even describe it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So mid journey can do this thing where it says, here's the prompts I would use to make images that kind of look like that. And um, if you'll notice, it's not very descriptive. Mm -hmm. um, it uses a bunch of secret code words for its internal thought processes, <laughs> which you would never have guessed, right? So with magnifying glasses, there aren't any magnifying glasses in the style of Soviet. Yeah. Okay. I don't funny. know where that comes from. Fluid and organic. Nothing in here is fluid and organic. So transcendent, stylish, fluid gestures. It likes the fluid thing for some reason. Eye-catching, repetitive. I would not have come up with a repetitive. So it's it's funny that the command that you use to, to do these things, it's literally called describe upload image. So to my human brain, it's always meant, oh, it's describing the image. Um, and if I gave this to ChatGPT, ChatGPT will actually now describe an image. And you can say, you know, it would say, it looks like there's two people in lab suits and they're doing some scientific process. Oh, and I noticed the microscope. That's the kind of thing ChatGPT will say. Mm -hmm. Midjourney doesn't do that. It gives you a prompt that has some relationship to what a human would say about it, but mostly it's internal thought process about what it sees, right? So this is what it generates off the first prompt, the mm. second prompt, the third prompt, the fourth prompt. So, um, so I learned today for the first time that taking a copyrighted image and asking Midjourney to hallucinate about it gets you images that are different, but obviously inspired by that copyrighted image. So I don't know how to feel about this exactly. Um, mm -hmm. I I feel like the like the amount of it's it's really just an impression. You know, get an impression of this image and then create completely new images. Um, so it feels like that's fair use. Does that feel like fair use to you guys? Or I think so. Inspired by without chewing it up. Yeah, I mean that. That genie is out of the box. <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> you know, now that just asking that question helped me think also, you could take a number of images like this, create a bunch of uh, a bunch of them. And actually I do this all the time. I'll take these kinds of, of descriptions, give them to chat GPT. So you could take four different source images, generate, you know, uh, 16 different um, prompts that are in the right direction for, for mid journey. And you can tell ChatGPT to mix them up. So at that point, it's, there's nothing of the original left really. Interesting. Very little. Wow. So, this. so this is a way to get pretty much what you want um, without having to figure out the inscrutable. Um, or at least way closer. Yeah.
I'm way closer. I the, totally fair, you know, like, um, like we kind of thought this image here, this upper, upper left one was fun, but, um, but it's also like, it's got these physically kind of like ludicrous things about it. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's some techniques that you can use to, um, hear, hear variants of that. Um, oh, I want them to look surprised and, oh, I, I don't want their hands a certain way or something. Hmm. One of these. Yeah. That's just really amazing. I was just reading uh, a couple of weeks ago that a guy won a photo contest, uh, $25,000 prize uh, with uh, <laughs> an AI generated image. And then he fessed up and gave the money back, but they were all mad at him. Just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to happen. Like you said, the genie is out of the bottle. Yeah, we, we, yeah. We, may we live in interesting times. Seems all, oh, my. all too true. It would be nice to slow it down a little bit, but oh. I think that's uh, it's only going to go get faster. Between the place we started this conversation today, just Hamas's thing in the Middle East and how that might bubble out, um, climate change and this year being the hottest on record as opposed to last year being the hottest on record and the, the spike going upward quickly and all the permutations that that leads to, and then the geopolitics of all the above mixed into the world, it's like crazy times. Jerry, we should right now be in a phase of mobilization. Uh, the, the, what, what turns out you now is, and this is really what AI you know, is helping us to understand, it's not carbon. You, know, they, you, you can fight carbon all day long and reduce it. No, it's biodiversity and it's uh, having roots in the ground. You know, the, the hydrological cycles have been so disrupted now that that is actually more of what we experience as climate change than carbon in the atmosphere. And the only way you can fix that, when you think that 80% of water globally is used by agriculture, the only way you can fix this is by changing agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do you change agriculture? Well, it's a whole systems change. Now you can't change any component without changing everything. Now, and so, so, but you can't, you can't break through. You know? So I come in with this super you know, uh, high charged, uh, let's do stuff. And even people who are basically uh, aligned and basically, you know, wanting to do the right thing, feel overwhelmed with you know, the, the, intensity of uh, what I'm saying. So I have to always buffer myself down and, you know, yeah. I, I'm reminded um, a good person to have kind of crosswise show and tell about um, public communication in climate science and, and publishing um, nuggets would be Mark Trexler. Um, he's been doing a lot of that. And mm -hmm. just... Not not necessarily with any, I just some cross fertilization of ideas about you know how people consume things, how to publish things, you know, how to get them um, uh, reviewed, all that kind of stuff. Okay. It'd be a good a good resource. Yeah. So okay. we will be missing you. You'll be in Kabul the next two weeks, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. I and leave I, on Sunday. Yeah. I, I've forgotten how when Stuart's back, so I'll I'll figure that out. Uh, Pete, I'll communicate with you because maybe a thing to do is to meet here next week and you and I start doing what you just talked about. I think that that's a good idea. Um, and maybe you and I can check in on Friday uh, and do a little bit of... Yeah. So I'm going, to open, I'm going to open up a new section. Uh, I'm going to keep, keep with uh, uh, Gmail, there, obviously with uh, um, Google there, but Google Docs. But I'm going to open up a, a different section and start a new book, basically. Yeah, uh, a new book a, for the book two. You mean that with the new idea? Two. Yeah, well, yeah. Yes, that'd be a new Google Doc, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, sounds, sounds great. great. Very good. Thank you so much, Lovely. Cool. Thank you, Pete, for coming. Likewise, today. appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank yeah, you. appreciate it. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.